Jesus' heart. Now that he has come to us, he has unfolded the full explanation of who God truly is. You want to know who God is? Jesus came to reveal the Father. He actually said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's invited us into that same oneness. That's what we've been saved to. You know, I was driving around yesterday working and uh, I listened to like three messages from this one minister that I really, really appreciate and enjoy. And in that process, I, I feel like what happened was as I went into this other dimension of the love of God, we'll actually kind of talk about some of that later. And part of what he shared and the way the Holy Spirit and the way we just kind of uh, encounter, engaged and encountered that day or yesterday was directly about the two of you. And it, uh, I don't know, it just, not like there was ever a, a, an issue before, but it just, it's awesome to be a part of something where God just continues to take you not only deeper into the dimensions of his love, but when that happens, it actually affects the dimensions of the love that you have for people. And specifically, that happened to me yesterday with, with Pastor Jerry and Joy. So um, just really appreciate you guys. Really love you. Are so grateful for your hearts, the way you love, the way you lead, the way you support uh, people. Um, we had dinner with some friends last night, and they had only been to the church one time. And the thing that they, we talked about this for probably 20 minutes, was the example that they, continue, that they saw and how it blew them away with your interaction with people and the love, not only that you had for people, but like children running to you. And that is not true for everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it was true for Jesus and it is true for, for Pastor Jerry in particular and, and Pastor Joy and just the way people really love you guys. Um, it, it's evident of your love that really just opens a door for us to turn around and do the same thing for you guys. So um, we're thrilled to be a part of this church. It's very honored that you give me an opportunity to speak and Heidi and I to, to participate in a variety of different things. And our son, who's a youth pastor, to, to be able to do what God's called him to do. Um, our daughter will be home in less than a month, so we're excited about that as well. So anyway, I just wanted to share that before we got rolling this morning. Um, just, just, it's good to be in a church where love abounds. And if that doesn't happen from the top, it's not going to happen throughout. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. I also want to thank you, Joy, for what you just shared. If, if you take anything away from this service today, make it that. Um, truly, make it that. Um, and uh, just thank you for the vulnerability. That's not easy. And um, it's like my dad. When I see my dad cry, because it doesn't happen very often, I lose it. Like, I don't even have to know why he's crying. It's only happened a handful of times in my life. But I felt that same way with you, Joy, because it's just, it's just you, I, I love it, just the, the, how God moves your heart in that moment. It was just awesome to see that, and I think a lot of people were affected in that way. And uh, so thank you for that. All right. I've been up since 5.30 this morning waiting to do this. I got to do it once, and now I get to do it again. And so, so let's roll. Let's start here. Very, very familiar verse, John chapter 3 and verse 16. Reading from the Passion Translation, it says, For here is the way God loved the world. He gave His only unique Son as a gift, not, or you know, excuse me, so now everyone who believes in Him will never perish, but experiencing everlasting, or you could say eternal life. So here we have this example, this, this scripture that John writes about the expression of the love of God, the demonstration of God's love. And, and you see that what we're going to talk about today is, is the idea that when Jesus came, gave his life through his death, burial, and resurrection, we were saved from something, sin and hell. But that's not it. We're also saved to some things that I think when become the core of our being, make the, what we were saved from almost just like it's in the distance. Um... I'm sorry, is my mic? Oh, okay. I'm going to pray in just a minute. Okay, sorry about that. I apologize. I thought you were signaling to me. I was like, I, I, I know how to steal second and third, but that one I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. Um, but uh, anyway, so we're going we're gonna to get into what not 
like more so what we are saved to. And, um, and so let's, let's pray and then we'll dive into that. Father, you are so awesome and you are perfect love. You love us perfectly and we are so grateful. We just say thank you. Thank you that you continue to lavish us with your love. We thank you for the spirit that lives on the inside and that is our teacher and our guide. And we thank you that every heart and, and ears are open today to receive. I ask that you would help me to function under the anointing and by your grace to speak every word that brings forth power and love and is a reflection and a demonstration of you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, talking about um, during the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. So you see here that we were saved from something, sin and hell, but we were saved to something as well. And, um, and so it's, it's just, I think, wildly important that, we, the, that these things are prominent in our, in our life, in our culture, in our church. And that's not to say that they're not. It's just let's, let's take a, another fresh look at these things and let's just endeavor to go up higher. I believe God's doing something. It's already started. It's already in process. But I believe God's doing something in this church because, one, he loves us, but, two, he loves these communities that surround us and the, every place that, that all of us go and interact and encounter with people on a daily basis. He is so in love with every single one of us and every single one of them that uh, he's taken us up higher and there are things that are happening. And so this, what we're going to share today, I think is just designed to aid in that process and just continue to take us up higher in our relationship with him and our effectiveness in, uh, in who we are. And so, um, so we're saved from sin, but we're saved to something. And, uh, and in that passage there, it talks about eternal life or everlasting life. How many of you, when you think about everlasting life, it generally causes you to think about heaven or something off in the future? You don't have to raise your hand, but that's probably true for most of us, right? And then I raise my hand like a boot, you know, goofball. I tell you not to, and then I do it. Um, so anyway, moving on. Jesus actually defined eternal life. We have a beautiful passage of Scripture, the last, I believe it was the last gathering of Jesus and disciples. John records this in John 14 through 17. And in verse, or chapter 17, Jesus actually prays. And when he prays, he actually prays for us. And we'll show you that in a minute. But in verse 3, he says this. Eternal life means, he's praying to the Father in this, in this moment. Eternal life means to know and experience you. So experience the Father as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the Son whom you have sent. Jesus defines eternal life as something that's happening right now. Not something that we're waiting for in the sweet by and by in heaven. Oh, one day we'll get there. He says, no, you're in everlasting life. You're in eternal life right now. And that is to know and experience God as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the Son who He sent. So according to Jesus, we're already living in eternity. So there are some things that we're saved to. And what that looks like, what, what I guess what we would call, these are kind of some things within the context of what we would call eternal life. So the first one we want to look at, and this is not an exhaustive list, but there's just three things we're going to look at this morning that are what we are saved to. And the first one is oneness with God. Oneness with God. Yeah. All right, somebody's excited about that. <laughs> Isn't that wasn't it? Yeah, wasn't that? That was moved by the Spirit or by a screen of some sort, but we're going with the Spirit. But uh, oneness with God. We weren't just saved to escape sin and hell. We were saved to oneness with God. So in John chapter 17, same chapter, down a little bit further, this is what Jesus said. And I, remember I said he prayed for you. He prayed for me. Here it is. And he said, and I ask not only for these disciples, but also for all those who will one day believe in me through their message. Is that us? Don't we believe through the disciples' message? Absolutely. And so he's praying for us in, this, in, this, in these next few verses. It says here in verse 21, I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us. Think about that for a second. Jesus is praying for us to become one with God. And when we say God, we're talking Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
just like he and the Father, and you could add the Holy Spirit because they're all one, just like they are one, that we would become one with them just like they are one with one another. That's one of those things that you got to kind of, you know, marinate in for a bit. (laughs) To where it becomes the core of you because it'll change things. It'll affect things. Because how you see God directly impacts how you see yourself. And how you see yourself directly impacts how you see everything in life. So it's very, very important that we recognize what we've been saved to. And this isn't something like, hey, you know, we're going to throw these things out here, what you've been saved to, so you need to wake up and you need to do better and you need to get yourself together. No, this is an invitation into something that you're either, maybe you've not experienced before, or if you are experiencing, to do it to a greater degree, to a a higher place, okay? So he goes on to say this, or he says, I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. Do you realize that our acknowledging and walking in agreement with this truth, that I am saved to oneness with God, actually causes, there's a grace that comes, and we're going to talk about it as we go, but there's a grace that comes that literally allows us to become like Him so that the people around us will actually go in some capacity, maybe not these exact words, but they will recognize Jesus has come from God. It's come from the Father. And it also will impact... If you've got a group of believers, and, and, and how, do you, how do you get unity amongst a group of believers? Have everybody focus on their oneness with God, and then it actually will impact the relationships around us. To we, we will a- operate out of our oneness with Him instead of any sort of selfishness. And so there's a lot of things going on here with this reality and acknowledging the reality of, that we were saved to oneness with Him. And so it says in verse 22, For the very glory that you have given to me, I have given to them. Is he still praying for us? He is. And and so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. This is the heart of God. It's an invitation into oneness with him. That's one of the reasons why Jesus came. So that we could operate in that place. Part of that is having a revelation of the Father. Colossians 3.10, again, I said a minute ago, how we see him affects how we see ourselves, and how we see ourselves affects how we see everything. So Colossians 3.10 says this, for you have acquired new creation life. Is that something that's coming? We hope for someday. No, it's past tense, isn't it? It says you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. Look at it this way. We were from the light, restored to the light, to be like the light. Right? Oneness with God is oneness with light, and we literally are to be luminescent as He is luminescent. Jesus is the light of the world. We are like Him. We are the light of the world. Goes on to say this giving you the full revelation of God. So in other words, there's this new creation life that we've received by grace. When we acknowledge it and, 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 you know, grab it, accept it by faith, actually what we're experiencing is this continual renewal to be more and more like Jesus, which we were created to be, right? Genesis 1.26, he said, let us make man in our image to be like us, right? So that's the original intent. That's the original blueprint And what Jesus did actually brought us back, the word reconcile that we read there in that first verse um, actually means to restore or to recover. So we basically have been restored back to the Father in the position that we were originally created to be, and that is is, uh, um, in that place of, of being just like Him, sons and daughters of God. So that process, what happens is, is we we gain a full revelation of God. We know Him. We're not talking about just knowing him academically, intellectually. But what we're invited into is a knowing him experientially. Okay, right? Remember what he said? Eternal life is to know and experience him, right? As the one true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the one who he sent. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. In, in um, you know, I've heard Pastor Jerry say this for, for many years, even before... 
even, like, we've been here five years, and I've heard him, heard him say this for many years before that, but that is, it's not, it's not good to know the Word of God but, and not know the God of the Word. Right? We can study the Word. We can know the Word. We can quote the Word. We can memorize the Word. We can do all that stuff. You can do that independent of an experience and a, and a, and, and a oneness with the Father, the God of the Word. But that's not, that's not why Jesus came. Right? That's, that's living well below what we're invited into. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Amen. 1 John 1.18 says this, No one has ever gazed upon the full splendor of God except the uniquely beloved Son, who is cherished by the Father and held close to His heart. Now that He has come to us, He has unfolded the full explanation of who God truly is. You want to know who God is? Jesus came to reveal the Father. He actually said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's invited us into that same oneness. That's what we've been saved to. And so <clears throat> there's an intimacy involved in this. It's experientially. It's not just a knowledge of him. It's a knowing him. Like you could know about a celebrity that you've never met. But that's not the same as knowing your spouse or knowing a friend who you spend time with. Right. right? There's a difference there. There's a difference there. Big difference. And so this is what we're invited into. We're invited into a oneness that is the experiential knowing of God. The revelation by experience, not just revelation because I heard about him. Kind of a thing. The intimacy, Colossians 3, 3 and 4 says this. Your crucifixion with Christ. How many of you know that we were crucified with Christ? Galatians 2.20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. This is him talking about it in Colossians. He said, your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tide of this life. Yeah, you know, as we were in worship, I thought about the phrase, live in your best life. That could be this verse right here. He says this, you've severed your ties to this life, which is not your best life. He said, and now your true life or your best life is hidden away in God in Christ. How many of you realize that God has a, a preordained life of victory and fruitfulness and abundance and wholeness and, and success and joy and peace for every one of us? And everyone who's not of us, right? He's, he's already prepared that. And so he's saying that that life... That life, your true life, is hidden away in God in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed, for you are now one with him in his glory. So again, if we're looking at this whole, you know, death, burial, and resurrection thing, like I, I don't have to go to hell and I get to go to heaven. I got it right that time. First service, I mixed them up and I was happy to go to hell and not go to heaven. And that, <laughs> people were confused. A couple people left. Like, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so, so if, that's all, if that's all we're looking at this like and we just live life and cruise control, casual cruise control Christianity, we, and again, I'm not talking about, hey, you need to do better or try harder. I'm not trying to bring condemnation. What I'm saying is there's an invitation to greater that Jesus has prepared for us. There's an invitation to greater that we were saved for, okay? And so there's an intimacy involved in this. And, and here, you know, we need to, to come to grips with a reality that may be challenging for many of us, and it's that God is fascinated with you just as you are. I mean, think about it. He sent his son to die for you way before we were ever here, knowing full well every mistake we were ever going to make. Like, it shouldn't be a question, should it? But it still becomes, it presents some challenges to us, doesn't it? But the reality is, is he's fascinated with us. But he's so fascinated with us, not only does he accept us just as we are, he, he's, he doesn't want to leave us where we are. Because we're saved for greater. Because he died for greater. Amen? He delights in you. He cherishes his time with you. I've said to God, and I'm just going to be honest, I'm not, I'm not there in this moment in my life. But I'm on the journey, and the way I see it is this way. 
get on the journey and just refuse to exit. You might not be where you want to be, but you're never going to get there if you exit. You will get there if you, st- if you refuse to exit. Just stay on, th- stay on it, right? Now, I don't remember where I was going with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, on this, we're on this journey. One of the things that he said to me during one of our, um, and I'm sorry, I point over there because when I come to Encounter Night, that's generally where I go, <laughs> is over there. But um, so he said to me in one of the Encounter Nights recently, he said, the benefits of union with me are not just in the destination, they're more so in the journey. Because we need them in the journey. Once we're there, we're there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we need them in the journey. So the benefits are in the journey. And I think he wants us to enjoy the journey yes. and not just be in this sense of like, well, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Because the enemy will take advantage of that and, you'll, and, and just, well, you're not there yet. So you're not, you know, he'll have you on this hamster wheel kind of a thing. But now that's not it. It's a journey of oneness because we were saved for greater. Yes. Oneness with him. There's a word that the early church fathers used called perichoresis. It's a compound word. Peri is where we get the word uh, perimeter or like circle. Choresis is where we get the word choreography. The picture that it paints is this. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Perfect love, loving, perfect love, loving, perfect love in this circle dance, if you will. And we were actually like birthed out of that. Like perfect love had to be expressed. And so God created us to love us. And so we were, we were birthed out of that. But then, as we accept the Lordship of Jesus in our life, we actually get invited back in to experience the face-to-face. And it's, it's amazing to be able to do that. And, and again, we're on a journey. And I feel like just, you know, um, being real honest, this is where I was going before, being real transparent. I'm going to follow Joy's lead this morning and, or this afternoon and, and be transparent. But being transparent... I feel like it's not that I've never experienced this in my life. Thankfully, I pastored a church for quite some time. Um, So it's not that I've never experienced this in my life, but I feel like I've stepped into another dimension of it. And I think it's directly tied to the dimension that we're stepping into as a church. And so, listen, you want to be a part of it, and this is going to require, it's going to be required. Again, not like, hey, if you don't do this, you don't get in. No, it's like, this is what is going to, this is what it's going to take to, walk in, in, in these greater places, okay? And it's not hard. How hard is it to, to, to have an intimate relationship with somebody who created you to love you? Like, we're not talking about somebody that's against you, all right? We're talking about somebody that loves you more than anybody else there is. And so, again, he's fascinated with you. But the things that, that um, Zach and Gina are doing with Encounter Nights, School of the Spirit, on the first and third Wednesday of every month, Pastor Jerry, primarily, I think, I don't know, maybe some other folks, but doing with uh, Encounter Night School of the Word on the second and fourth Sunday uh, or Wednesday of each month. And then uh, if there's a fifth Sunday, we're doing School of, the, uh, School of Prayer. But there are some, some key things that are happening in those, in those gatherings. And they give us an opportunity. Like, we, you can engage in intimacy with God anywhere. I was in my car yesterday, and I experienced a... Let's just be honest. It's just like what Pastor Joy was talking about. It was a mystical experience. And don't let that freak you out because mystery and mystical are from the same root word. So it's, it's really not a, a problem. Um, it's just something that's supernatural is basically what we're talking about. And so it doesn't have to be in a group setting. But there are things that God will do in a group setting because he's endeavoring to take us all to a place and it allows things to move swiftly more so than when it's all just individual. They all, the individual times and the group times all work together, but there are things that happen in a corporate setting that are beneficial because we all get to experience stuff at the same time. And so I encourage you to be a part of those, be a part of the services. You, you know, I mean, literally we can live our life in the perichoresis. We can live our life in that oneness, in that face-to-face place. You as a, as a mom taking care of your kids at home, you can live in that place. You as a, as a dad taking care of the kids, it's not just about the moms, a, on a job, in a business, whatever it might be, whatever it is that we're doing, we can live in that place because we were saved for oneness. Amen? And so um, the second thing that we want to look at is that we were saved for beloved righteousness. 
Beloved righteousness. There's two parts to this. There's the beloved part. There's the righteousness part. I like to bring them together because they, they overlap so much. But righteousness, um, the Greek word is dikeusene, which I probably am saying wrong. But anyway, it means this. It means the state of one who, uh, the, the state of one who is as he or she ought to be. Well, what does that mean? That sounds kind of weird. It essentially is this. We were created in the likeness and image of God to be like Him, right? So we were created, that was the intent. That's the blueprint of our life. Beloved son or daughter of God, okay? Sin messed that up. Jesus came, restored us back, right? Now we are invited back into this, this restored place of, of oneness with God. And so when we talk about what, what we are, what we that we are as we ought to be, we're basically saying that what's happened is, is that that as we were created is who we actually are. We became something else through sin, but that doesn't define us. We actually are operating from a place of victory when we start. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about here. That whatever place you find yourself in life, whatever mistakes you've made, things that you've done, things that you didn't do, whatever that might be, it may have led you to a place in life where you are now, but that's not who you are. Right? right. And so this, what happens is, is when we, when we come into alignment, into agreement with the fact that we are righteous, that we are as we ought to be, then that actually says to me, I acknowledge that I am who God says I am. And then there's a grace that faith accesses in that moment. And in, and in, well, it's not just a moment, but it's in that, in that space that actually empowers us to become. We just talked about it a little bit ago in that chapter or that uh, uh, verse in Colossians where it said that we had received new creation life and that we are continually being renewed. That's, that's what we're talking about. But, um, so, but the moment you believe you are restored to that, that original creation of the beloved child of God that you were created to be, all right? We walk it out because, you, you know, you have things that have come into your, your mind, your heart, your being through experiences, through culture, through things that were said about you, things that were done to you, things that you did, whatever, right? So that kind of clouds all that stuff up. And so there's a process of, of, that we walk out of kind of eliminating all that and accepting and walking in the grace that allows us to become what we already were created to be. Does that make sense? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, we see this statement. For God made the only one who did not know sin, talking about Jesus, to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with Him. Right? So here's what happens. Whose righteousness is it? God's not a trick question. I kind of people are hesitant because the last one I kind of was a trick, but it's God's righteousness, right? So here's the thing, and this might make your head go tilt for a second, but just just think about it for a minute. The moment we believe we receive God's righteousness, we are as righteous as God. Now we don't become God. There's only one of those, but we were created in His likeness and image to be like Him. And that's basically what's happening, is that that's the, we are as we ought to be. The moment we believe, then what happens is we receive his righteousness. In that moment and and forward, we are as righteous as he is. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, he's perfect and I'm not. Me either. But that's through the lens of the mistakes, not the lens of righteousness. When I look through through the reality of righteousness... I'm looking the way God sees me as he created us to be and then there's a grace that allows me to experience that renewal and become more and more like Jesus. Again, we're from the light, restored to the light to be like the light. Right? And so, John 15, so that's the righteousness part, the beloved righteousness. Now here's the, the, the other part of this, the love part. John 15, 9. Jesus says this. He says, I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. Now, the word same there means um, same um, nature and measure. So we're loved with the same nature of love and the same measure of love as the Father loves Jesus. That's a really big deal. It's another one of those things that you've got to kind of marinate on because that's generally not what we 
I don't want to say it's not necessarily what we taught. I think we have such a familiarity with the fact that we're loved that we almost kind of overlook it and miss the fact that there are multiple dimensions to the love of God that we continue to, to, to experience. And so we are as loved as Jesus is loved. And that is a big deal. That's a game-changing deal. And so I would encourage you again, we're invited into these truths I'm personally convinced of this more and more all the time that one of, if not, if not the most powerful thing we can do as believers, certainly one of the most powerful things we can do is what Heidi and I have called bask in his love. What is that? That is basically having a consistency in our life of the acknowledgement and, and the declaration, if you will, of I am loved just as Jesus is loved. That God is fascinated with me. That he cherishes his time with me. That he loves me deeply. These sort of truths. And sometimes you just, maybe you put on some worship music. Maybe you put on whatever it is that you enjoy. Just maybe nothing. Maybe just quiet. It can be in your car where it's not quiet. It can be wherever. It doesn't matter. But just, I think some of the greatest things that we can do, one of the greatest things we can do is just purpose to bask in his love to marvel at the depths of his love and just allow the Holy Spirit to show us things that are going to speak to us regarding the depths of and the, and, the, and the dimensions of his love. And I think as that happens, it becomes the core of us. And again, we have a revelation of God based on what Jesus revealed of him. And we have that intimacy with him and we're experiencing a grace and we're in agreement with that we are loved. We're in agreement that we are righteous. And what's happening is, is we are flowing in a grace that is causing us to experience some things continually that are taking us up higher and higher and higher. And we're becoming more and more like Jesus and it's completely void of self-effort. Because there are things that we've been trying to get free from for years, through, probably through self-effort, that grace will actually deliver us from way easier. Or at all. <laughs> right? Because a lot of times self-effort doesn't... Self-effort is just that. It's you. Grace is him, his ability in you. And it's a night and day difference. So we want, it, we, want to, we want the grace. Remember this. Behavior doesn't have the authority to change our identity. Right? Your identity is not based on your emotion or your, you know, what you think, what you feel, like all that. It's not, it's not based on that. But identity does have the authority to change behavior. So if we get a hold of the reality of what I'm talking about here, what you'll find is the grace will empower you to overcome things that you've struggled with for a long time. Amen? And a key component to that is how loved you are. Because when you know how loved you are and you know he's safe, You'll open yourself up and he'll begin to pour things into you that'll bring transformation into your life that you'll be going, well, how, where did that happen? How did that happen? I've struggled with that for 20 years. What's going on here? I don't even think like that anymore. I don't even feel like that anymore. Whatever that might be. And I'll give you an example and you guys can all laugh at me. And I'm sure none of you have ever experienced this. Um, so I'm going to ask, and I, I do want you to raise your hand. How many of you, while driving, experience people with lovely driving skills? And yes, I'm being sarcastic. All right, everybody. <laughs> there are certain things people want to raise their hand for. It's awesome. All right. I drive a lot, which means I experience a lot of lovely driving. And I'd be lying if I told you in the past there weren't some times that I said some things about some people who were lovely drivers. Like what? I'm not going to say. But they weren't nice. And, yeah, we're going to leave it at that. But anyway, so oh, a couple months ago, John 15, 9, I love you with the same love that the Father loves me, right? Just read it. I just thought, man, God, I, I'm, I'm diving into this. Like, I'm going for it. I want this to move me every time I read it, every time I see it. I want this to transform my life. I want this reality to be so strong in me that it just brings transformation. So I gave him permission. All right, so what I started doing is, every, not every morning, because that would be a lie. So most mornings, before I get out of bed, I was reading the scripture. And I, what was happening was, is there was, a, there was a part of it that was 
an acknowledgement and, and a transformation that was taking place in me about my own life. I am loved with the same nature and measure of love that Jesus is loved with. But what happened then is it, it became that I saw that toward other people. And so now it's like, okay, other people are loved with the same nature and measure of love that Jesus is loved with. So a couple weeks ago, I'm driving. One of those lovely people did a lovely thing and in the vehicle there, right? And so I get ready to call him stupid or whatever. Sorry, kids, that, don't say that word. I, I'm getting ready to call him something. I don't remember what it was, idiot, something like that. Anyhow, <laughs> mid-sentence, independent of me thinking, I literally said, you, one who he loves. <laughs> and I literally, it was like I was sitting in the passenger seat and looked over like, what? At me driving, right? <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? Like something came out of your mouth and it was almost as if you were not part of it. <laughs> and it's what happened. And instantly I went back to the seeds that were sown before my feet hit the ground about people being loved the way Jesus is loved. So I was experiencing transformation, not because I was trying to be a better Christian, not because I was trying to be more moral, not because I was trying to correct my behavior, but because I was basking in his love and it brought grace that brought transformation. So we are saved to beloved righteousness. Third and final thing we're going to look at. Again, not an exhaustive list, but some pretty, pretty high, pretty, ones that are pretty high up on the list, but not everything that we are saved to. But the third thing that I want to look at is this, and it's the immovable life. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at it this way. We all encounter things in life that present the opportunity to move us in a bad way, right? Move us into worry, move us into fear, move us into doubt, move us into discouragement, right? Move us into actions that are detrimental to us and other people, right? They, it, it, it's something that moves us. You get some sort of diagnosis from the doctor and that moves you. You, you know, fear comes to you about some situation. You're encountering something you see no way out, right? I'm saying that we're saved into a life where we don't have to be moved in those situations. Or if we are moved, we're not moved for long. And it's built on the foundation of the first two things we talked about. And that is oneness with God and beloved righteousness. It's built on those two things, those foundations of those two things. Jesus is our example. Everybody cool with that, right? He came as an example to us, right? Did Jesus live the immovable life? I think he did. Let's look at a few examples there. Sleep on the boat. Right? In a storm, waves are rocking. I don't think it was a cruise ship, so I think it was a pretty small boat. And the Bible actually says water is coming into the boat. So I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd do a real good job of staying asleep if I'm getting wet. So he was operating at a level of peace that was pretty substantial. And, and they're moved. And here's another thing about being moved is there's times where we were moved that we become very susceptible to offense. So they actually are saying to him, don't you care about us? They're not only moved, they're offended. Right? They're moved to offense. And they're afraid. They're moved to fear. They're moved to worry. They're moved to offense. And so there are, come on, man, wake up, do something. We're all going to die. So the rage of the storm had actually gotten into them. Jesus wakes up with peace in his heart because of really oneness with God and knowing he's beloved and righteous. <laughs> really, if you really want to know the reality. He wakes up with peace in his heart and speaks to the storm out of that peace and the rage of the storm has to obey the peace that's in him. Right? So what happens? Not only is he not moved, but he's actually positioned to move what's moving them. And that's how people are going to know that Jesus was sent from God when we operate this way, right? Lazarus was dead four days. Jesus was not moved. That is substantial. Because if you or someone you know or someone you encounter, 
It doesn't even have to be you. You can come up against somebody that's going, got something going on, and the Lord, you just have compassion, and you want to pray for them. But you're looking at them going, ooh, I don't know. Like, what's going on? I'm moved in that moment. And let's just be honest. We probably have all been there, right? But Lazarus was dead for four days. So we're talking zero blood flow, zero brain activity, decomposition already probably taking place to some degree, and it didn't move him. So we can actually, we're saved to live in a place that Jesus lived in this immovable life to where it doesn't matter what stage it is. It doesn't matter how incurable it's supposed to be. Death is incurable outside of the kingdom. And it didn't move him. All right? I know I'm setting a pretty lofty bar, but I'm just telling you we're invited into this. And I might not be operating in at, the, at that level anywhere close myself yet, but I refuse to get off the exit. All right? And I believe that's true for all of us. So, Lazarus is dead four days. People trying to kill him. Jesus not moved. Right? <laughs> the... the, the Man that was like in the, well, was in the caves or in the tombs, whatever it was, demon-possessed, they put chains on him, he breaks him. Jesus is not moved. Right? He just touched him. The one place we see him move, Pastor Jerry spoke about it just recently, and, and that was in the garden where he was moved, but it was just for a moment. Right? Why? Because of his oneness with God and because he had a revelation of his of beloved, of beloved righteousness. Right? I mean, Jesus says, like, so let's look at it this way. John 15, 9, we read the first part. It says, for I am loved with the same love that the Father loves me. You, I love you with the same love that the Father loves me. The second part is this. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. I think one of the ways you do that is the basking in his love that I was talking about earlier. Another way you do that, and these are kind of overlapping, but is the intimacy that we talked about earlier, Right? There are, these, are, these are ways that what are we doing? We are continually allowing His love to nourish our hearts. So in that moment where you're presented with something, if, that, that, if, if, if we're continually allowing His love to nourish our hearts and those truths become the core of us, then that's the filter that whatever we experience goes through. And if we're moved, we're not moved for long or we're not moved at all because we know Him. Because we have oneness with, oneness with Him, we know how loved we are. We know that we're as righteous as He is, and we know that He is for us. Amen? And He's with us. Not only that, but this is exactly how Jesus operated. In verse 10, He says this, I continually live nourished and empowered by my Father's love. So we're invited to the example that Jesus set. We're going to need to do it the way Jesus did it. Right? So let's look at a couple of scriptures, and we're going to wrap up. Oh my goodness, where did the time go? All right, Romans 8, 37 through 39, real quickly. He says this, Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all, for God has made us to be more than conquerors. And His demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything, right? So now I live with this confidence, that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate me from God's love, which is His glorious victory over everything. I'm convinced that His love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken His love. Verse 39, there is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. That's what we're saved to, right? That's what we're saved to. We're saved to the immovable life. Last scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Then, by constantly using your faith, again, our faith is, like, listen, faith is trust. How, how, how easy is it to trust somebody who created you to love you, right? Like, and, and it, it, that has invited you into this oneness and all these things that we're talking about. Like, your faith is going to find a, a place that you've never found before. So constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root. What do roots do? Roots produce fruit, don't they? Of your life. So what are we, what are we talking about? We're talking about living. This is where Jesus lived. He lived in that resting place of the Father's love and it produced the fruit in his life. 
Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is His love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. And this is where Pastor Joy talked about this in week two of the um, time, time for War series. She mentioned that one of the, this is the phrase that, that uh, she talked about that I had talked about before. But this is, this is part of this experience in my own life is that I've come into this place, my wife and I, where we'll say things like, I'm too loved to experience that. I'm, I'm too loved to not overcome that. I'm too loved to not love. I'm too loved to not forgive. I'm too loved to be anxious. I'm too loved to be stressed. I didn't say stress won't present itself, but I just am too loved to participate. Right? I'm too loved to be sick. I'm too loved for other people to be sick. Like, they're too loved to be sick. Right? And so what is happening? We're, we're, we're walking in this immovable life. And we're experiencing that His love and how it affects us. And so you're saved to be one with God. You're saved to... Beloved righteousness, and you're saved to the immoral life. Er, immoral. Ah, that's not it. The immovable life. <laughs> Man, can I get through one message without mixing stuff up? You are not saved to the immoral life. Okay, let's be clear about that. <clears throat> you are saved to the immovable life that will keep you from the immo- immoral life. <laughs> and now it is time to pray. Father, thank you so much. You are awesome as always. We just thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can have fun. Thank you that you just continue to, to, to just pour into us and bring us up higher and help us to have a greater understanding of our oneness with you, of our beloved righteousness. And Father, that we can live the immovable life that you might be glorified and that others would not only come to know you, but would say, yes, he is sent from the Father. We give you all the praise and the glory and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.